morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jen May Gray. Um, you already met my um, practice and partner, Maria Arcaro. We're both associate professors at Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. We also practice together a small design studio called Made Studio. And the work that I'm going to share today, I'm going to um, share a few excerpts from uh, a forthcoming chapter, Inhabiting the Water Cycle, which will be published in Third Coast Atlas, Prelude to a Plan. Um, the research was funded through both Taubman College Architecture and Urban Planning's um, Research Through Making Grant, the U of M uh, Office of the Vice President for Research, and the Graham Sustainability Institute in partnership with Data Driven Detroit. When illustrated for children's textbooks, the water cycle is depicted in a state of perpetual motion. Big blue arrows demonstrate the various states of water as it circulates between the sky in two pristine conditions of land and ocean. In example after example, the representation of water cycle processes are both conceptualized and recapitulated within abstractions of nature devoid of ubiquitous ground conditions that manifest within um, the constructed places of inhabitation. It should therefore come as no surprise that the water infrastructures within urbanized areas are expected to keep the nuisance of water out of sight and out of mind. Despite the tremendous amount of effort that's been devoted to making precipitation invisible once it hits the ground, the visual and physical experience of dynamic weather systems are an important reminder that we are in fact inhabitants of the water cycle. This perpetual schism between water, earth, and air is both a representational design challenge as well as a technical one, even within the greatest abundance of fresh water on the earth in the Great Lakes Basin. On the ground, a century of engineering paradigms propelled by the headlong pragmatism of the wastewater treatment industry have led to infrastructural failures occurring at astounding rates with a future that holds ever more uncertainty given the intensity forecasts of um, climate trends. Throughout the extensively urbanized geography of the Great Lakes, point source pollution has historically been um, particularly da damaging. Um, but now we've moved into a, a moment where um, non-point source pollutions, as we heard earlier, um, are, the, are the largest challenge. The legacy of wastewater infrastructure construction presents a second ongoing challenge. And in the Great Lakes Basin, we hold 70% of the total combined sewer overflows across the entire United States. While faster and cheaper to construct initially, these systems now pose technical and conceptual challenges. Technically, obviously, there's a massive amount of wastewater to be held. Um, in 2010 alone, the outfalls in the eight Great Lakes states released 18.7 billion gallons of untreated wastewater and stormwater. And conceptually, I think we would be better served to reclassify them not as point polluters, but as non-point polluters, and prioritize innovative approaches to holistic upstream design. Responses to failing wastewater infrastructure will determine the future of water quality and the experience of contemporary urban public space in the Great Lakes. As a case study, Detroit is exemplary of a paradoxical condition marked by ongoing city depopulation, yet regional growth. Um, and these things are nested in the way that the infrastructure is constructed. From the perspective of wastewater infrastructure, these dynamics present a formidable problem with contradictory and demanding terms. In essence, this is the challenge of managing and maintaining a system that has literally reached beyond its municipal limits and grown beyond universal affordability. Recently, as endorsed by the EPA, the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department adopted a more acupunctural approach and um, are also working on a series of green infrastructure um, points across the city. So the work that we've contributed has been thinking about um, that opportunity in particular um, and thinking about the green plus gray as a promise to not just deliver technical um, outcomes, but also um, civic and cultural outcomes in the way we reconstruct public spaces. Beyond the technical, the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department also faces questions tied to neighborhood identity as they transform, ba transform vacant properties with their capacity to hold memories um, and associations into novel and aesthetically foreign stormwater management sites. The design opportunities emerging from this are many. To do so, we must first learn how to recuperate the visibility of urban waters. Redrawing the city's topographic surfaces to reveal how water flows enables a clear identification of areas of hy hydrologic fragmentation or continuity. Once stormwater reclaims the ground, the city can then be reimagined with watersheds rather than hidden infrastructural sewer sheds. Taken together, the patterns of vacancy, land use, zoning, rights of way, 
and the projective cartographies of water become valuable tools to a more integrative approach to infrastructure at the metropolitan scale. And ultimately, design can form a bridge between quantitative and qualitative goals as natural processes are reintroduced to the city toward the production of new culturally relevant landscapes. Thank you.